Welcome, everyone. My name is Adol Korkor, and I'm the founder and the CEO of the AB Korkor Foundation for Mental Health. I welcome you again for another webinar, which is part of our continuing education uh, related to mental health. Now, the topic that we have today is extremely important. It's something that many of us do suffer through, uh, which is failure. However, uh, Dr. Herzola is going to be our presenter today, and he's going to tell us that there is a, a, a help with failure, and there is a possibility based on the neuroscience uh, of, of, of our anatomy, of our structure, that we will be able to overcome that and, in fact, use it as a tool to succeed. It's really an honor to have Dr. Herzola with us today. He, he, the topic of his discussion is the neuroscience of failure, a proxy for mental health. Uh, Dr. Herzala is a founder of Palestinian, Palestinian Neuroscience Initiative, Al-Quds University, Abu Dis, Jerusalem, Palestine. He's also a research scientist at Center of Molecular and Behavior Neuroscience, Rutgers University in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, Dr. Herzala, it's a pleasure having you on board, and, uh, and I look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Kirker. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and to join you today. And um, I'm really uh, very excited to talk to you today about uh, one of uh, the very dear topics to my heart, actually, which is which is uh, failure and uh, neuroscience, actually. So when you mix the when you mix both, it's, it becomes uh, much more appealing to me personally. So um, so let's uh, let's set it off, actually. So um, neuroscience and failure and mental health. What is in common between these three? How can we actually make use of um, whatever is um, is uh, of 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 these three? How does our brain process failure? How can we actually kind of uh, uh, look and, uh, and and learn from the different different layers uh, that that come with the topic? Uh, but before actually kind of delving into um, the neuroscience of failure per se, uh, let's talk a little bit about mental health. And um, actually, uh, let me let me use a, an anecdote from uh, uh, from the, the the Middle Eastern region. Um, Arabic music is a very rich um, uh, discipline, as opposed to Western music, which is also rich. But Arabic music is is much richer in terms of the number of scales. And whenever you start with a what with what is called an improvisation, you start with a topic, you start with a scale, you go to to multiple different scales and there are actually almost uh, um, almost 18 of them and then you end in the same scale so basically um i would like to imagine myself doing an improvisation in, in arabic music and i'll start with mental health we'll go through the neuroscience the behavioral science of, of failure and then we'll end back in mental health so what is mental health how many layers are there for mental health um myself my expertise is focused on the biological aspect of mental health how does the brain produce what we refer to as mental health? But actually, this is not the only layer of mental health. Um, mental health has the biology part of it, which includes genetics, which includes uh, neural circuits, which includes neurochemistry, uh, which includes epigenetics. But that's only the biology part of it. On top of that, if I may imagine it as layers, uh, there is basically the behavioral and cognitive part on top of circuits and networks and so on and so forth. And basically, um, on top of these different behaviors that are governed by these circuits, there is what we call symptoms. And on top of these symptoms comes what we call mental disorders, if the expression of these symptoms is severe enough to actually qualify that person to be or or uh, be thought of as a patient in this in this kind of context. So, and on top of all of that, there is the environment, and there is the society, and much larger constructs than the person themselves. And all of that, all of these layers, all of these constructs together form what we call mental health. So. One of the, the uh, favorite models in this topic for me is called the biopsychosocial model. So it has biology, sociology, psychology, all working together to define what we call mental health. For lack of a better word, unfortunately, 
we only define mental health in the in the form of a binary, which looks at people as either normal, mental health wise, or abnormal, having a disorder. And basically, if you think about it from a historic perspective, mental health inherited this this way of of thinking about uh, the topic from infectious diseases. So a person in order to be called a patient should have the pathogen infectious diseases or is free of the pathogen. Therefore, we, we call them patients or non-patients in this kind of context. And um, based on this logic, there were thresholds that were, de that were developed for mental health for the expression of multiple symptoms that actually could define whether the person in question has, a, has passed a particular threshold for becoming what we call a patient according to these you know, conventions of thresholds. And usually uh, people like to think about passing through another criteria uh, or another set of criteria for mental health that people refer to as four Ds in order to call somebody a patient, which would, re would refer to danger, dysfunction, deviance, and distress. So if somebody has these symptoms or some of these symptoms that qualify to be called a disorder, plus the four Ds, then actually they would qualify to have mental ill health. And I prefer this term much better than actually saying a mental disorder, which gives mental health the whole concept of, of, um, of continuity. But apart from that, if we think about the symptoms in front of us, low mood, stress, insomnia, avoidance, fear, anhedonia, obsession, there is always if you, if you actually dig a little bit deeper in each one of these symptoms, there is always a process that is failing. So again, when we, th when th when we think about all of these things, uh, when we think, for example, about low mood, it's basically not, 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 having, not having the ability to, to, um, to, to experience the, the surroundings in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that actually gives us uh, well-being, if you want to think of it this way, anhedonia. And the inability to experience pleasure, avoidance, the inability to approach or the failure to approach, and insomnia, the failure to sleep, and so on and so forth. So in this context, how, how do we define failure? And is it a construct that could actually help us understand all of these symptoms and the multidimensionality of these symptoms, the symptoms and ultimately what defines mental health? So what is failure? And uh, accordingly, um, we want to think about it in, in multiple contexts, actually, to, to be able to um, understand properly what is failure. But similar to what I mentioned earlier, mental health is a multi-layer con multi concept. So in order to understand failure properly, let's define it according to these multiple layers. Let's talk about it in the context of symptoms, similar to what I mentioned before, in the context of cognition, and in the context of neural circuits. And basically for the sake of, of uh, simplicity and focus, we'll focus on the cognitive and the symptom aspect of it. Uh, hopefully in neural circuits, we can, we can um, you know, uh, refer to it whenever possible, but uh, it, it will take a much longer time to actually explain the basics there. So let's focus on these different constructs or layers of what we call failure. So again, what is failure? If we think about it in the context of gaining or losing, Failure is either the loss of something or the failure to gain something. And by the way, these are not equivalent. And both of them in, in, this, in this kind of context, if we define it as the outcome of the action that we're doing, should and could define what we call failure. Another way of looking at it is not related to the outcome of the, of the process that we're, we're describing here, but related to basically the action that one takes or the response that one takes, whether you're avoiding something and therefore failing to accomplish it, or basically not making the action altogether from the get go and therefore not approaching that particular aspect of it, which people could call or refer to as failure still. So in this kind of context and basically to summarize how we can basically, uh, you know, in a reductionist manner, think about failure, I would like to use basically the backbone of behavioral neuroscience or the backbone of, 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 
how behavior happens. And uh, a, a field that was founded by, you know, really amazing scientists such as B.F. Skinner and others in the early in the, the early 1900s in the early um, 20th century, which basically sums behavior into this very small equation, if I may call it. A stimulus that is associated with a response that is associated with an outcome. And in the context of failure, as we defined it earlier, it's basically focused on either the response or the outcome. And let's take it from there, actually. Let's see how can we think about it in the context of response and outcome and in the, in the context of a stimulus. And for that purpose, we want to use very simple computer games. So let's, let's look at it together. How can we translate stimulus, response, outcome into a very basic um, um, you know, process that would allow us to understand this, this, uh, this, uh, you know, the, this basic mechanism properly and reflect it back into the mental health uh, domain. So here is the stimulus part of it. If I give you two choices, a hot pepper or an apple, which one would you choose? So this is the stimulus part of the thing. Then actually, if you say, I want to make the choice of the left option, of which is basically the, the red pepper, then actually the outcome is going to be, you will, you know, um, uh, uh, feel the tinge of that, of that red pepper, which is considered to be a negative feedback. For example, if you give it, you give it to a, a, a younger child, they will cry because of the, you know, of the, uh, of the hotness of the, of the red pepper. Similarly, if you choose the apple, as, as, a, um, as, as the stimulus and you make the action to approach the apple, then actually the feedback is gonna be positive. You will, people mostly like the sweetness of the apple and then they would appreciate it. And there is another option there, which is not making an action at all. So let me go back here. We have two stimuli. People either make an action of selecting the right or the left, and then they get an outcome based on that. And basically, it can be a positive outcome, as in the case of the apple. It could be a negative outcome, as in the case of the red pepper. Or you choose not to make an action, and therefore, you don't really experience any of the positive and negative outcomes. Let's look at this in the context of another process, where you have positive or neutral outcome. And here we have an, an apple or a maple leaf. And similarly, this is a stimulus. You make an action, you select the maple leaf, but it's it's you know it's not tasty. It doesn't have any kind of incentive to it. It's not a, there is no hedonic aspect to it. It's not it's not a positive thing if you think about the maple leaf. But if you make the action and you choose the apple, then actually you get the positive feedback. Similarly, you can actually avoid making an action altogether. And this is actually one comparison between a neutral and a positive outcome. And later we'll see actually that this could be also referred to the stimulus being a neutral or a positive stimulus, but we'll talk about this later. The last example is related to a negative and a neutral outcome. And similarly, you can actually, again, compare the maple leaf and the red pepper. Similarly, you can make an action. You choose the red pepper, it's a negative feedback. You choose the maple leaf, it's indifferent, or you make no action and still you get no feedback, you don't know. And according to this, this kind of logic, one should actually try to understand the basic principles or the basic components of the process that we're talking, we're talking about here. So there is the stimulus, there is the action that you make, and there is the outcome that you receive. And if we actually try to, you know, again, mathematically represent it, it would go along three axes. The first is the stimulus. It could be an appetitive or an aversive stimulus. And these are actually termed barred from behavioral neuroscience or behavioral science actually in general. Appetitive means has a positive, you know, uh, hedonic state related to it. And aversive has means that it has a negative, um, you know, hed hedonic state as associated to it. And let me give you examples. So it's not, it's not appetitive in terms of the outcome, it's appetitive of the stimulus itself. So for example, if I, if I tell you um, uh, basically, um, you know, sunshine, sunshine is, is, a, is a visual stimulus. And usually these stimuli are sensory stimuli. So you either see them, feel them, or hear them, and so on and so forth. So for example, bad smell, 
electric shock or aversive stimuli because basically it's it's a stimulus if you think about it it's it's uh, it's sensed by the by, by the senses the other axis that we're talking about here is uh um, you know referring to the response that one makes and we saw how you could actually approach select the apple or select the red pepper or avoid not make the action or even actually withdraw which is something that we did not refer to in the example and the third axis that we could think about and again you know excuse my two-dimensional way of portraying this but this these are three dimensions basically you think about them in 3d is the outcome that one receives and it could be a positive outcome or a negative outcome and if you think about this this figure in front of us produces eight cubes if you if you imagine the three-dimensional structure each cube is represented by a particular dimensionality in the stimulus in the response and in the outcome as it's governing um you know dimensions and this allows us to think properly about failure in this kind of context. So what is failure in this kind of context? It could be anywhere. It could be a positive stimulus when somebody approaches it and gets a negative feedback, for example. It could be an aversive stimulus with one avoiding it and getting a negative feedback. So it, it could be anywhere. And that actually is a very important lesson to learn, which is failure is not one thing. And it cannot be tagged as a negative thing all the time. It could be positive, by the way. It could be active, where you're approaching something. It could be passive when you're avoiding something. The stimulus could be luring, it could be appetitive, and you still actually kind of fail in that kind of context. So this kind of multidimensionality way is very important to think about because it allows us to understand these processes in a way that would allow us to infer this understanding into or back onto mental disorders. So let's go back to stimulus response outcome. And this is a basic process that basically governs um, behavioral neuroscience. And ultimately it, we can draw a lot of conclusions based on our understanding of the stimulus response outcome in the context of failure. And how does that reflect on a lot of mental health uh, and uh, mental ill health or mental disorders? Let's take problems that occur in the stimulus and one example on that is post-traumatic stress disorder. And if you think about it from a, psych a psychiatric perspective, PTSD is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a triad of symptoms or symptom clusters that are referred to as arousal, re-experiencing, -exper re and avoidance. And these include a constellation of symptoms that would ultimately lead to the person, you know, um, not being able to forget a traumatic event that happened to them. So basically you get exposed to trauma and then one month later, you still experience these um, symptoms that are basically debilitating and interfere with one's daily life activities and one, one's uh, productivity. And therefore we refer to it as a disorder. So how do we infer our understanding of the stimulus response outcome and failure onto post-traumatic disorder? Again, using cognitive and behavioral neuroscience, there is a trauma, which is a starting event, which is followed by a flight or, fight or flight response. And by the way, it's not fight or flight, it's freezing, flight, and fight, if you want to order it properly according to its occurrence in terms of the behavioral response, which is basically a, 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 a way of, of expressing a negative feedback. So ultimately, what we're talking about here is a stimulus, which is a trauma, a response, which is something here in this kind of uh, in this kind of, uh, of of state you don't even choose it it's it's a it's a programmed response and then the outcome is almost always negative how do we test that how do we learn about failure and how does the brain process failure we use behavioral paradigms and this is actually a process that we call fear learning and extinction so what we do here in the, in the and you can see the mouse in a box here we call them as skinner boxes we we, um, you know, we associate a, a, a an auditory tone with a foot shock. There is actually an electric grid on the floor of the Skinner box that you can see the mouse inside. And every time there is that auditory tone, we provide a mild uh, foot shock 
to the mouse so that they, you know, they experience a little bit of discomfort. And with time, with, with, with multiple trials, as you can see, the mouse starts freezing more and more and more whenever they hear, they hear the tone. And freezing, as I showed earlier, is one of these, you know, physiological processes that show us that somebody is afraid. Then in the next phase of this, this task, what we do is that we don't even associate the tone with the shock. Now the tone is the stimulus. So whenever the stimulus happens, you can see that the, the mouse or the rat is always freezing. They're always afraid, regardless of the occurrence of the shock. And you do this infrequently so that you don't, you don't habituate the mouse to it. The last, the last two phases are called extinction, extinction training and extinction um, uh, testing. So in extinction, you overload the mouse or the rat with these, um, uh, you know, um, auditory stimuli, but in a different context. And this is a very important shift here that would actually allow the mouse or the, or the rat to write a new form of memory, a new form of association between the stimulus, the response, the outcome. And as you can see with time and with training, and that's actually a very important concept here, you can train the mouse or the rat to stop fearing the same auditory tone that led them to freezing initially. And again, if you look at the extinction testing or the recall, they hardly remember that this was actually a tone that was associated with them being afraid. If you compare the level of the freezing here with the level of freezing when we were testing the fear expression. So this led um, a group of researchers and this actually this movement in, in trying to understand PTSD started in the late 80s uh, um, by really great researchers such as uh, Roger Pittman in, at Harvard Medical School to think of PTSD as a failure to distinguish learned fear disorder. And if we think about it further, yes, it does relate to the symptoms of arousal, potentially to the symptoms of re-experiencing, especially if you're talking, for example, if a, uh, an American soldier went to Afghanistan and, uh, for example, a... Um, you know, uh, a, a bomb blew in their tank, and and, and basically they developed post-traumatic stress disorder based on the psychological trauma, and then they came back to the U.S. and they were in an elevator, and they they, they heard some form of, of an explosion, so, such as uh, such as um, you know um, 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 you know fireworks. You would think that actually, in the different context, the first context where they got the trauma was the tank, it can find space. A similar context was the elevator, another confined space. So if they hear the same stimulus, they will exhibit the same response, which is all things related to the psychological trauma. They'll re-experience re what they went through, and this will lead to arousal. Avoidance in a different construct. However, I wish it were simp as simple as this. It's not, and the expression of symptoms that you get throughout mental health disorders is not a one size fit all. There is no one process that could actually explain it, but we learned a lot about the, the pathology of PTSD from understanding, you know, how the stimulus is processed and how it leads to a response and the outcome. Let's move to the next part, response and schizophrenia. And as you might know, schizophrenia is, is um, you know, the hallmark of which is, are delusions and hallucinations. Why, whether auditory, auditory or, um, you know, or visual or any of that. And basically, if you think about it, um, in, in, in schizophrenics or schizophrenia patients, regardless of the kind of stimulus, they will always, you know, form their own reality, which is far from what we define as reality in the, in the actual real world. So they will think they will have ideas or, uh, or ideation that is not realistic. They will perceive uh, sensory stimuli that are actually not even there. And basically this shows you that their response is always, you know, aberrant. And one way of looking at it is another behavioral task or another behavioral game, if I may call it, which is basically, uh, it's, it's uh, related, it's, it's called actually a stimulus response compatibility. And then basically, as you can see on the screen here, it shows you what button to, to press what button to to um, you know to to click on, and ultimately, regardless of the stimulus, schizophrenic patients always choose the si the same response, regardless of the instructions that you give them. So basically, 
if you give them left here and you teach them that it's going to be left and you, you you move them from the compatible to the incompatible phase of the task, they will continue to press left because basically there is some form of automaticity and they have an, an, an inability to encode stimuli properly. And apparently this is a, um, um, you know, a, um, a reason to develop this kind of response automatic automaticity. So therefore, there is a failure to encode and there is always this response automaticity that actually leads potentially to explaining what happens in schizophrenia in the context of delusions and hallucinations. Last but not least is major depressive disorder. And as um, you may know, um, let me call it clinical depression or depression is usually defined as the loss of pleasure and low mood, and hedonia and low mood as the two cardinal symptoms of depression. And a lot of theories actually think of depression as the inability to see the positivity. So again, how can we think about this in the context, uh, context of stimulus response outcome? They, are, they basically, patients with depression fail to see the positive in the world. They, see, they fail to see the, the, the motivation aspect of it. And one way of testing that is again, another behavioral paradigm. It's similar to the example that I showed you, where you actually teach the subjects to learn whether tomorrow is sunny or rainy based on a card. So they train them as a, as a fortune teller. And basically some of these cards have no feedback. Some of them are, have positive feedback. Some of them have negative feedback. And accordingly, you know, what can actually kind of deduce and learn the associations over multiple trials. But patients with depression, exhibit positive hyposensitivity. They don't learn from the positive feedback uh, feedback aspect of it, and they're hypersensitive to the negative feedback aspect of it. But if you think about what happens when you treat these patients with antidepressants, antidepressants actually restore the balance between positive and negative sensitivity, not by fixing the positive hyposensitivity, but actually by causing an additional impairment in negative hypersensitivity and, and converting that into a negative hyposensitivity. So basically, and it's a very common um, method in medicine where you actually impair a process to fix another broken process, but actually, basically, you're not fixing the problem. You're causing a new problem to fix an already existing problem in the context of depression. And this shows you, again, another form of what we call failure in this, in this kind of context and how we can think about it in, in the form of multidimensionality and how this multidimensionality can actually define failure along any of these axes, along any of these processes, and ultimately um, let us know more about, about actually how the brain operates and how the brain works. For example, and I'll, I'll be very brief about this part, uh, when we talk about positive outcomes, as opposed to negative outcomes. There is there's a, a large body of literature that suggests that actually dopamine, the neurochemical, is very important for encoding this kind of information in the brain. When we talk about approach and avoidance, again, there is actually a huge literature on multiple types of monoamines, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, and being actually very important. Um, the encoding of stimuli, the role of different burn areas, um, you know, such as, um, basically the prefrontal cortex, the cingulate cortex, the insular cortex, in their ability to actually process these information and ultimately produce what we call, you know, behaviors. And if these behaviors are aberrant situations, we ultimately think about it as symptoms of psychopathology. And similarly, one of actually the, reason, the reasons I'm, I'm, I'm putting this in front of you again is that to think about all of these symptoms, forget about the depression, PTSD, or schizophrenia binaries, zero or one. We want to put all of these symptoms on this multidimensional processing approach and actually let them be the defining uh, processes for us to understand how mental health happens and what does it mean to actually um, you know, have a constellation of these symptoms, which is ultimately the goal of mental health because mental health, again, is not infectious disease. It's a multidimensional construct. So instead of this, we want to reach out to actually have normal and disorder overlap in a way that would actually make mental health more of a continuum. 
of the, the multidimensionality of these symptoms and ultimately allow us to understand how does this make does this make us human and how can we actually come up with better solutions for treating mental mental uh, ill health for example if you think about all of the antidepressants that we currently have they all, they're only effective in 30 percent of cases only some similarly this applies to psychopathology to any type of treatment for depression so the response rate is only 30 percent and with this i come to an end so um this is basically a way of understanding what failure means and how it doesn't really define one particular construct and how it could actually kind of allow us to understand what is mental health. How could mental health um, you know, be understood better and how could we actually understand the different layers of mental health when it comes to the symptoms, when it comes to the cognitive aspect of it and to the neuro response. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, this, this was just this was quite a journey for me. Uh, I, uh, I I I thoroughly enjoyed this, and and I really love your your the continuum concept. I mean, I think that that's what we all kind of forget about the fact that it is a continuum, and and not infrequently it is it is a um, it is a, a, a process that we all go through at some point in our lives. I mean, there is no perfectly mentally healthy individual. It depends where you are, what time and what situation and under what circumstances. I mean, there is always that continuum, that spectrum that you're, you're out there, you know, which I really puts a totally different perspective of how we address mental health, how we approach it. And, uh, and 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 deal with it. I promise you, the term mental ill health is going to become something that I'm definitely going to you know, <laughs> utilize more. And you know, as you know, in my foundation, we always refer to mental illness or mental disorder or whatever. I love this mental ill health. Yeah. Yeah. I Let, should, I should. Yeah, I, should, I, should say, I should say actually this um, um, th this comes from um, uh, a huge project that I had the honor of contributing to at the Lancet actually it's called the Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health and Sustainable Development. Mm -hmm. so basically, um, the whole aspect of it is sometimes you know I mean we use language in ways that would become hardwired in, in some way in our brains, and ultimately it kind of changes our way of thinking about some some topics. So if you refer to somebody as a patient or as something as a disorder, you automatically stop thinking about it as part of the natural continuum. Oh, yeah. And that's actually why we still want to refer to it as health, but it's L health, you know, if you think about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I have to ask you a practical question, and that, that is something that I think that we all, uh, I listened to your TED Talk. I was really inspired by it, and I think that's why I reached out to you. <laughs> as you may know um and 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 we all have our ups and downs and uh, when i watched your TED talk i was in a down mood and i was feeling a failure i was feeling i should have done this better i should have done this and done that and then i left your TED talk inspired and engineered by the fact that me uh, we as a human being have the capacity of turning that negative um, emotions, that 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 uh, blaming, that anger, into a positive, energizing, reforming kind of an energy. Am I correct in that interpretation? Of course you are. Of course, that's how how our brains are built, basically. Actually, exactly. Yes. So now that now that we are there. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about how we can, as human beings and all of the challenges that we face, how we can try to avoid going deep into that self-blame, self-anger, I'm a loser, I lost, and then start becoming more opportunistic about saying, you know what, this is probably means that I'm going to be able to deal with it and maybe get over it by doing this and this and this. 
Well, one way, thank you for, for, for bringing that up. It's a very, very important topic. And actually, it's just all about being more analytical of the surroundings, being being more analytical of, of what one has done or haven't done, okay? And basically being being more aware and attentive to some of these details. For example, if you think about it in the context of what could have been probably the case, what could have been probably the outcome? Yes, you know, maybe somebody failed at that stage, but the reality is there was a very good chunk of probability that they could have succeeded as well. And we always forget about that because failure is the very end, you know, outcome of the process here. But there is also the possibility and the probability of, of, of succeeding. And it's just a matter of tracing somebody's, you know, um, 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 you know, steps back to try to understand what was the process that entailed reaching to this outcome. And again, you know, let's anal analyze it using that stimulus response outcome, every single step on the way and trying to see actually to learn from the process. So, and actually the, the, something that is extremely important in this kind of, of processes is it's never a failure or a success. You don't know. And uh, let me quote Steve Jobs here. Steve Jobs says, you can never connect the dots looking forward. You can always connect them looking backwards. And that's actually a very, mm -hmm. very interesting way of thinking about it because ultimately you don't know. Maybe this failure happened for a reason that actually would ultimately teach you a skill that you can use sometime, you know, later along the line. Maybe you can actually kind of, um, uh, it, it kind of exposed a, a, a route that is potentially not good for you, that could lead you to much more negativity. Maybe it actually, this is, this is, and, and this is still a very valid way. And that's the beauty of probabilities. You know, it's possible all along. Everything is possible. But ultimately, if you think about it in, in this kind of probabilistic manner, you open up a lot of other options and a lot of other venues there for you. And um, again, let me quote another great, uh, great thinker, um, uh, Richard Feynman, who literally in a very beautiful interview, and uh, people can watch it on YouTube, says, I'm okay with not knowing. So basically, that's actually another way of thinking about it. It's, you know, the, the, the whole concept of uncertainty. You know, when you fail, you literally touched one of the outcomes, but you don't know the rest. You don't know what could happen if you try again. You don't know what could happen if you actually kind of, again, trace your steps back and try to understand what really happened. And one should be able to actually say, okay, I failed, to take active responsibility. And there's a huge difference between, you know, being under the, you know, the, the circumstances and being on top of the circumstances. And basically seeing the big picture and seeing actually that the, the, all of these are ultimately possibilities and probabilities. Yeah. I, I love in, in your presentation when you talked about sometimes, you know, we don't act or, you know, we see an opportunity that we missed, but we intentionally or unintentionally just let it go. And then we come back and say, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, this could be anywhere from making a decision to buy a stock or to buy a home or to date that person. And then suddenly time went by and now you look at it and say, oh, my God, what did I do? But it was my inaction that really led to that outcome. It's not the fact that it was there in front of you, but you inacted. But now you're regretting not having acted, but you've made that decision to enact, and now you're blaming yourself for failing. Very important concept here is time. So once time passes, you can never bring it back. And that's actually a very important thing to always kind of, you know, the whole concept of letting go. And let me put it in a very simple, very simple terms. It's just, you know, it passed. And that's a very important strategy actually to always adopt, which is once something is over, it's over. You learn from it. The best outcome that could happen there is, yes, I learned my lesson. And it's actually about the way you look at it. Again, you know, it's just, are you under the circumstance or on top of the circumstance that actually kind of led mm -hmm. to what happened? And ultimately, you know, um, there is a very intriguing cognitive ability that we have as humans and other, like other animals, of course, called generalization. And basically, generalization is all about the ability to use learned 
um, associations between stimuli and, and responses and outcomes to generalize to novel situations. So the reality is, yes, maybe you failed in this kind of situation, but ultimately you will be able to use it much later and your brain, believe me, is, is, a, is a very, very capable machine, if I may call it actually, for lack of a better word, to actually use this kind of knowledge that was gained in subsequent uh, interactions. And I don't think anybody would lose in missing an opportunity. They would, gain, they would have gained a lot. I mean, of course, this doesn't apply to all sets of circumstances, but at the same time, always think of what could happen or could have happened ultimately uh, in terms of negativities as well, if what you missed already happened. And you could also think about all of the positivities that you missed, but you could also think about all of the negativities that could happen or could have happened if you didn't miss. So that kind of cancels things out. Got it. I didn't hear uh, about the language that we use to uh, talk about mental health. I appreciate your changing the actual language that we use to speak about mental health, about our health. The inherent negative in the very words we use to speak about our health pushes the stigma deeper. Are there any resources that you can recommend on this topic, changing the language of the conversation to a positive language? That's an excellent point. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think basically, you know, again, language is a culprit when it comes to how we think about mental health and how we actually kind of think about patients. Every time you think about, you say patients, you know, you're literally categorizing them. You're, I don't want to say discriminate. It's not you know, per se, like per se, it's not discrimination, but basically you're putting them in a separate category. And ultimately, um, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, there is this effort that I had the honor of contributing to, which is called the Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health and Sustainable Development. It has a lot of these really, really very important concepts. And as I said, uh, for example, one of the movements that we, we launched there was to refer to it as mental ill health rather than, rather than mental disorders, uh, and to actually try to, you know, um, say, persons or individuals instead of patients, for example, uh, because that's extremely important. Um, there are actually really very well, um, you know, uh, well-regarded ways in psychology and approaches in psychology. Uh, for example, you know, you, you, don't, you don't say a depression patient, you say a patient with depression, if even if you want to say, use the, say the, the word patient, because you don't want, like, linguistically, you don't want to basically define the person with the disorder but this is a person with a disorder, not a person defined by the disorder. So this is actually another way of looking at it and thinking about it. Um, the other op, 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 you know, effort that is actually really significant these days is at NIMH, the National Institutes of Mental Health, which is called the RDOC, the Research Domain Criterion. And it's a really beautiful initiative that actually deviates away from these binaries and binary means it's a zero or one, it's a patient or a normal person. And actually it focuses on the expression of symptoms. So whatever we call depression, clinical depression is basically a constellation of symptoms. You need to have two cardinal symptoms and some four minor symptoms in order to, uh, for over two weeks, of course, that would interfere with your, your daily life activities to actually qualify to be called a patient with depression. Uh, but ultimately our doc, which is not currently, you know, advertised as a, as, a, as, a, as a diagnostic tool, thinks of anhedonia, loss of pleasure, low mood separately, and thinks about the neural circuits and the cognitive, um, you know, processes that are involved in these. And ultimately, each person becomes a constellation of these different symptoms. And uh, as, as, as you mentioned earlier, who is normal? What is normal? And ultimately, I don't think there is any concept or any construct that could ultimately define what is normal because I don't think it exists altogether. Yeah, I, I uh, thank you for the explanation and, and, and thank you for, for helping us, you know, starting to think twice about how we talk about our patients or, you know, um, I have, a, I have a, a question that came here that has to deal with ethnicity and failure. Uh, and there's a, a great deal of difference between certain culture, like Asian, um, 
you know, uh, and then where there's a higher rate of uh, suicide. And, and, and so is there really any ethnic, ethnicity, does ethnicity has any impact in terms of how we process uh, failure and how we, we address it and deal with it? Uh, no, no doubt about it. I mean, if you think about mental health as a concept, it has multiple layers. One of them is the societal aspect of it. And as um, I mentioned earlier, it's the, it's called the biopsychosocial model of, of mental health. And if you think about, um, um, you know, what this entails, you know, a lot of what we define as mental health is dictated by the society. And ultimately, failure is... If you if you actually kind of wanted if I want to distill ex exactly what I said in the in the in the in the initial presentation, it has a behavioral component to it, it has a cognitive uh, component to it, it has a linguistic component to it, it has a very big you know societal and normative um, uh, component to it, and ultimately what is defined failure in in, in East Asia is very different than what is defined uh, like what, what 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 is defined as failure. In, in, in the Western world, for example. And ultimately, this reflects on, you know, again, a stimulus, response, outcome, way of thinking about, about these, these processes. And ultimately, if you define failure accordingly, then it's a negative feedback, and this actually kind of can bag propagates into the response and into the stimulus. And ultimately, this can this can actually define these um, you know these these social normatives in a very different way. So yes, absolutely, there is a very big ethnic component in how do we define failure. Um, but actually, I you know the way I I, I study things in in my own research uh, is is basically devoid of these variables because what we what we really focus on is to try to be language independent, culture independent, even to some extent even age independent in how we define these processes in order to actually kind of, you know, produce ultimately tools that would help us, you know, use, um, um, you know, use these kind of universal skills that come from behavior and the brain for us as humans, per se, uh, to try to actually kind of diagnose and properly treat mental health. So that's actually the, the ultimate goal. Uh, but ethnic differences, yes, absolutely. But if you think about it in terms of the basic behavioral processes, I mean, one of the examples I used was mice or rats. So rats and mice are capable of these behaviors. And therefore, I would like to say that if I want to think about failure in the context of negative feedback, well, not too much. It doesn't really have an ethnic or a cultural aspect to it. It's more of a normal or a natural function of how our brains work, ultimately. Yeah, a question that you refer to, and uh, can we build and endurance and resilience in, in our daily life to really help us become uh, capable of addressing failure, addressing those decisions that we make and we regret. No doubt about it. Actually, it's it's all about, you know, building these cognitive resources. It's uh, building this cognitive flexibility. It's about learning how to see the different pieces of the picture. It's all about seeing, you know, learning how to see all of the probabilities. So yes, Cognitive training has been shown for a very long time that actually it does significantly improve, uh, you know, people's ability to to be more flexible to make better decisions, um, and ultimately uh, there is actually a really large growing field about using computer games to do that, um, and ultimately using using you know proper training programs to improve uh, you know uh, one's cognitive abilities, and again, what is failure other than our inability to basically dissect the problem and sinking in the emotional aftermath of the potential negative outcome or the lack of action. So that actually kind of is the way to, to, to think about it. And yes, you can train your brain, you can become better at it. You can become better at failure. And if you think about our brain's ability to process failure, it's way higher, way bigger. We're much more equipped to process failure, if I want to define failure in the context of, uh, you know, of negative feedback processing, in the context of avoidance, in the context of, of fear processing, we're much better equipped to process these emotions and process these things than we're equipped to actually process positivity. But at the same time, we don't want these, you know, so 
if, if uh, again, if you consider the multi-dimensionality of what I just mentioned, it has a stimulus aspect to it, it has a response aspect to it, and it has an outcome aspect to it. And after that, it has an emotional tag response related to it. So if we get to the point where we literally, you know, actively try to dissect the different components, we can become better at failure. It's hmm. awesome. Question about parenting and, um, and you know, kids go through a lot of uh, setbacks, uh, whether it's school or exercise or sports or grades or, you know, relationships. And how do we as parents who have young kids can actually help them understand that and help them use the tools that you're describing that we exist in, in our body to deal or the challenges of failure? First of all, let them experience it. That's actually the most important teacher, mm. basically. It's just, uh, you know, give them space. Give them the ability to experience these emotions and to experience, the, experience these processes because ultimately, you know, um, some of these um, 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 networks need what we call pruning. And, and basically pruning is, is the ability to kind of be carved out of a lot of other possibilities for this network to grow in order to actually kind of train the network, you need to use it. And in order to use it, you need to actually try and fail. So that's actually step number one. Let people experience mm -hmm. these things. Let your kids fail. Fail properly in a safe and controlled environment that you can give them support. And sometimes your support is just listening. That's actually a very important thing. Don't, 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 don't tell them what to do. You know, let their brains help them. Let them build their own strategies. Let them build their own ways of how to get out of failure. Because ultimately, what is depression other than the inability to get out of bad mood? The inability to not, you know, to, 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 to get out of that inability to, to um, you know, to see the positivity in life, for example. So it's all about training. It's all about trying. And uh, let me quote uh, um, uh, Thomas Alva Edison here. When asked about... Uh, his inability to invent the light bulb almost 1,000 times, he said, oh, who told you I failed a 1,000 times? I just actually found 1,000 ways to build a light bulb that doesn't light up. That was it. So it's all about that. how you see it. I love that quote. I, I quote it all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I think every... Uh, uh, a uh, person has a story, and I have a story here from an individual who's stating that um, it, he's seen 25 therapists and numerous psychiatrists, and um, and he was suggested that having a multitude of mental health issues, ill health, uh, and then he's seen some of the doctors, and then uh, he also, I'm sure you can read the question, he, uh, he's, uh, this is a daily continued troubles, anxiety, written suffering in life. It's not living. Uh, I've tried ERP, CBT, SSRI, drug therapy, all have all failed. Uh, where do I turn next? And I have to tell you that, you know, having gone around, uh, you know, with the 550-50 ran, you know, on every state uh, and, uh, you know, we put together a documentary, Th those kind of stories were not uncommon. We, we heard a lot of those stories. You know, where do people go? Um, I, I honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm very disappointed in, 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 the, in the current state of things, unfortunately, uh, mental health wise, um, because um, there, there, is, there, there, there are a few options to tell you the truth. And, uh, you know, again, uh, um, uh, I would like to thank uh, our, our friend for sharing his story. It's ultimately, you know, really depressing uh, when, you, when you think about the options available for patients. But be your, your, your you know, the, the most important thing is basically to analyze your own lifestyle. Start with that. Don't think basically that you need an external chemical to fix your problem. Don't think that you need actually a therapist to tell you what to do. Take charge, be active, you know, think about things that actually could or behaviors that would get you out of the state. I mean, you're mentioning 45 plus years, 
all, um, I would I would imagine through these 45 plus years, you felt better, you felt good at some points. So revisit these memories. Think about what you did at that point. What was it that actually got you out of you know these symptoms? And uh, I I should also be very clear about the reality that actually some symptoms need help. So when somebody is is at the verge of uh, you know, for example, um, um, having suicide, suicidal ideation. Yes, these these are these are states when you will and should ask for help, and you will need help. But beyond that, there is nothing called normal. And sometimes it just as as uh, the great American psychologist Albert Albert Ellis says, you need to accept yourself and actually live, try to live with uh, you know with the current situation and make the best out of it. So, yes. Um, it is debilitating. It could be debilitating in this kind of context. The most important is over this period of time, think about you know, these increments of time when you felt better, revisit that, see what you did. Think about your lifestyle. What are you doing in your day? When are the times of the day that actually you feel better? When are the times of the day that you feel down? Do you have sufficient activities in your life that will actually make you interact with people? Um, do you have a pet? Do you do sports? Do you listen to music? You know, all of these are actually very simple activities that we sometimes, you know, overlook. But the reality is, you know, incrementally, these are what contributes to our, you know, the concept of well-being. So think about the well-being. And ultimately, do not think about the negative, the negative aspect of it. Again, nobody is normal. Each and everyone has his or her own story his or her own constellation of symptoms. And people refer to them as shortcomings, but I refer to them as being human. And ultimately, if therapy is not gonna help you change your lifestyle, then you will not get a lot out of therapy. So that's actually the most important. And I'm personally not a big fan of all of the neurochemicals that people you know, keep pouring into our systems. Uh, it's, it's not the way to deal with these problems. Um, and uh, for example, 10% um, uh, of Americans are on some form of antidepressants. I mean, why? Why is this even needed? You know, so that's actually a really big problem that we as a society need to actually think about and start developing ways that are cleaner, that are more sustainable, that are more scalable, that would actually um, uh, deal with mental health problems. But um, I hope this helps. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think this is a topic of another hour of discussion that we can have about <laughs> about the current current state of affair in reference to in in reference to um, uh, the drug therapy and what's available out there and and how we deal it in our society. And I know there's been a lot of discussion about different alternative therapy to that with cannabinoids and some of the others that are out there. Uh, you know, some of them are being tried or some of them are on the horizon. Well, we have a couple of minutes left uh, or less. Uh, so, Mohammed, at first I want to thank you. But before I thank you, I really want you to encapsulate a message, a brief message to our audience so that they can leave uh, with, with it. Uh, uh, uh. So, ne never think of, of the outcomes and define the journey with the ultimate outcome of what you do. Live all of the details. Think about the entire journey. Think about the time that you spent doing all what that journey entailed. And don't let the, 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 the very last instance define all of the efforts and all of the joy that you had in your journey. That is, that is awesome. And that is so wonderful. Thank you, Thank you so much, Mohammed. I really appreciate it. This was a wonderful hour. I've learned a lot. It's phenomenal. And, um, you know, for all of you audience, uh, I'm sure you'll join me in thanking, uh, <coughs> thanking uh, Dr. Herzala for this amazing presentation. And I also uh, thank you again. And I look forward to you having joining me in future webinars. But please remember, uh, we are a non-for-profit foundation. We can always benefit from your support. I always appreciate your support. And please have a wonderful, safe day. Thank you very much again and see you soon.